Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. So we finally have a bit of a pullback day, digestion day, if you will, as we sort of digest the previous games, the very defensive sector of technology, the, uh, the one uh, sector out of the 11 in the S&P making it a little bit higher today as uh, people flock to the, the, uh, the new defense of technology and the things that have been leading, things like energy, financials, industrials, all at the lower end of the list. So certainly a pullback, sort of a digestion. The question now as so many stocks are approaching key resistance levels, things like the financial sector approaching their 200-day moving average, is this the big double top that so many have been expecting, so many have been thinking about, or is this just a pause as we uh, continue to digest the previous gains and move on to further upside? My guest, Dana Lyons, hopefully will help us try to answer some of those questions together. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey everyone, welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close to make sense of the markets from a technical, behavioral, quantitative perspective, using the tools of the, uh, of the chartist, and also most importantly, connecting the short term of today with the long term trends. And, and I, I found investing to be all about identifying trends, understanding what's working and what isn't. And I find so many times investors, advisors, others get the blinders on, they focus on a particular outlook, a particular position. And charts allow you to make sense of what's happening around you. And, and again, now more than ever, so important to get a proper sense of, uh, of trends and relative movements. We have some great guests on, uh, on this show and elsewhere on Stock Charts TV to help us navigate the markets. Um, my guest today, uh, Dana Lyons, a fantastic uh, money manager strategist going to share his perspective in a bit. Tomorrow, we have Mark Ungewitter joining us from Charter Trust. On Thursday, Xenia Taubina from XD Financial Services joining us for the first time. On June 12th is our next episode of The Pitch. This is our monthly show where we feature a Stock Charts moderator and then three guest commentators, each providing five ideas and then uh, presenting each of them in turn and then uh, discuss them as a group. We've done a couple of those and they've been really successful, some great ideas coming out of it. So uh, make sure you catch that on June 12th. Next week, our next episode of Behind the Charts features Mike Turner. I met up with him at a recent money show, had a great discussion. He's uh, uh, certainly more of a quantitative strategist and money manager. It's interesting to see how he learned about technical analysis and created models based on systematic rules-based technical rules. And then on July 13th, the whole week is uh, charting the second half. Uh, it's a mid-year market outlook from uh, myself, my fellow Stock Charts contributors, as well as a number of, uh, of special guests. We'll be doing featured presentations all during the week on Stock Charts TV, some special events, and finish the week with a market outlook panel. So you're gonna wanna mark that down. July 13th is gonna be a fantastic week, making sense of, uh, of where the markets could be heading. Now, when you think about a market outlook as we transition here into our market recap, you know, up until today, I think yesterday, if you look at the last two days here on the chart, the S&P yesterday, is pretty much how the market has felt, sort of this slow and steady increase and then just this incredible uh, you know, cascade of buying that goes in the last, uh, the last 30, 40 minutes of, of trading, really showing you uh, in, in almost a, a euphoric scenario, right? Where there's just this, this fear of missing out, motivating buyers to push prices ever higher. Today, finally, a bit of a pause here and looking at a daily chart of the S&P, you know, again, we're still in a, in a pretty decent place. We didn't even get below the low from yesterday, but today felt like a huge down day relative to every day, essentially, we've had in the last, uh, the last week or two leading up until today. This sort of movement in any sort of market is not unusual, and especially in an uptrend, you need days like this to sort of process things. So uh, by, you know, let's keep perspective. The trend remains very strong. The market's overbought. Uh, the s and still in an overbought range with an RSI above uh, 70. So uh, uh, you know, but again, as, as we see this uh, relentless uptrend, this, this trend that just continues to pound higher and higher, uh, you know, I find myself looking for any indication of potential weakness. So on a day like today, it's seeing what stocks led the way down, what sort of rotations you can see, and identify if this may be the beginning of something a little deeper, or if it's just, uh, you know, sort of a, a digestion day, which is what I call sort of a, you know, had, had a run, 
you have the gains, you need to digest those, you need a minute sort of reset, get some profit taking in, which, which provides the uh, potential for further upside. So what can we do to try to make sense of that? Well, first, the S&P was down uh, still above 3,200, finished down uh, just over three quarters of a percent lower. Uh, the mid cap index down over 2%, the small cap index down over 2.5%. So this was certainly a flight more toward uh, the, the large cap, mega cap trade away from some of the more speculative parts of the market. Small caps have been leading uh, pretty well uh, going into today. So this was certainly more of a reversal back to the environment we had previously with more of a mega cap led environment. Technology, the only one out of the 11 S&P sectors finishing closer, uh, closing higher, excuse me, so tech up over half of a percent, that meant the NASDAQ 100, the NASDAQ Composite Index, both uh, in the positive. The VIX now higher, back above 27, but still relatively low uh, relative to the, the um, you know, high volatility environment we had during uh, the February, March timeframe. Looking at some other asset classes, bonds actually finished stronger, uh, big gap higher, and the TLT sort of chipped its way lower along the way, but finished up uh, over 1% and 10-year yields down to uh, about 83 basis points. Looking at the commodity index, uh, the commodities up uh, a token amount, about a third of a percent. Gold up 1%, which was a nice uh, uh, move higher. Oil up just a, a very small percentage and overall mixed with the rest of the uh, commodity complex. So it wasn't a huge moving day. It wasn't a big relocation. I think it certainly felt more like a digestion day. That, that idea of investors uh, taking profits, moving back toward a little bit of safety happened in, in a small way today with Again, tech being the number one sector, followed by communication services. At the bottom, you have some of the sectors that have been leading in the last uh, couple of weeks, financials, energy, industrials. And, and we've, we've been surprised by the rally uh, in a lot of these sectors, the big banks, uh, the energy companies, uh, industrials, defense names, aerospace, all rallying significantly, uh, airlines as well. All of those sort of, you know, coming back to earth, quote unquote, just a bit, but again, still in a pretty strong consistent uptrend. Remember, I would never draw too much of a conclusion on one trading day. Remember, uh, a trend is made up of a series of days and you build momentum over uh, a period of time. And that's what that's what tells you the overall environment to pay attention to. In terms of uh, making sense a little uh, little deeper, interesting to see gold miners back up in the top 10. So the, the uh, gold mining group up two and a half percent. Computer hardware up number one. And that's interesting because if you look at Apple, it was one of the better charts uh, today. You know, as we talk about stocks that are, you know, testing highs, and we've looked at the XLK yesterday and, uh, and on Friday, we've looked at tech, we looked at um, financials, you know, at these, at these significant resistance levels. Microsoft comes to mind as one of those stocks that's right at that key, uh, you know, level, retesting the previous highs. So, you know, high of around 190 from last February. We're just uh, traded above it, unable to close above it today, but a new closing high for the 52 weeks um, today, but sort of right at that level. What's interesting is if you look at Apple, just today really finally pushed above the highs from January, February, really rallied into the January highs, retested in February, came off, now has round tripped it and now arguably pushed higher. Apple's actually almost to that extremely overbought reading an RSI above 80, which usually suggests a little bit of a pullback, but enough momentum to continue the, the further uptrend after any sort of corrective move. So certainly this rotation back to tech today is pushing charts like Apple further up. As a sector, though, you know, I think you still have to, you know, you still want to see sort of follow through. Apple has appeared to have done so. Others have not. So you want to see the follow through, being able to see if this uh, if the sector can move uh, move higher. Not that that's a requirement. And, and again, someone asked me about financials. Is there a requirement that the XLF breaks above its 200-day uh, moving average. You know, no. Uh, the market could certainly go higher without financials. Financials had a, a pretty good run. They could correct a little bit. And if, if tech, you know, moves higher and if people flock back into Apple, uh, Microsoft, other names like that, could continue to push it higher. Maybe some communication services as well, Facebook and others. Certainly that could drive the market a higher, get back to that sort of, uh, you know, fang trade sort of uh, a lead, lead market. But the fact that we've started to rotate back into the more value-oriented sectors, financials and energy, I don't know if we're at the point where we can now switch gears completely back to another total leadership uh, environment. So, so my guess would be, or my, my assumption would be, I think the market has further upside, you know, extended upside to retest 3,400 and go, and go beyond if charts like this resolve higher and they have not, have not done so yet. So I think you know, again, the, the concern sort of across the board with stocks is the retesting of resistance, the overbought conditions, and just seeing uh, where things go from there. 
Let's rotate in just a little bit of a test on uh, check on breadth. Uh, we talked about breadth in pretty good detail yesterday, but I like to just sort of uh, check in with things as we're talking about a market recap. So breadth readings in, in most ways that I would measure it, um, you know, continue to move uh, higher. This is the, uh, these are the cumulative advanced decline lines for the major uh, cap tiers has not been updated for today. So they'll pull back certainly uh, today once we digest the, the closing values for everything. Um, but overall up until today certainly have been, uh, you know, overall very, very positive. Small caps were the last one to sort of indicate that positive move and now continuing to, uh, to move in a, in a positive direction. I think it's also worth noting that uh, the new highs list continuing to see some new highs emerge on the S&P. The chart of Apple is one that obviously, uh, you know, I just pointed out earlier. The more apples that happen, the more semiconductors break out, the more, you know, stocks retesting those highs actually go to new highs. That's where this indicator is going to start to turn higher. That's what would give me the confidence that, you know, we're potentially going to, uh, going to continue to upside. Also worth noting, 98% of the S&P above their 50-day moving average. That's up from 0%. That tends to, you know, mean in the short term, you could be a little overextended. But overall, for me, it's more valuable as a long-term indicator in that sort of move up from zero. And the percent of stocks above their 200-day up over two-thirds now, about 68%. That's more of a bull market characteristic than a bear market characteristic. So you're starting to see those signs of, uh, of market extension, but uh, overall support for further highs. So until we see some, you know, sort of, uh, sort of pullback, I think the, uh, the, the path of least resistance appears to remain to the upside. That's our market recap for today. Try to touch on a number of different things that have caught my eye on my reviews uh, today. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Be back with my guest, Dana Lyons. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. want to thank you, as always, for joining us for the final bar. As a reminder, we're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in the show. We get all of those questions from you, from the viewers, sending in your questions, things you're running into, things you're struggling with. Uh, nothing's out of bounds. Please let us know how we can help you navigate things. Uh, just shoot us an email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com, or on Twitter, just tag us in a comment, at FinalBarSCTV. We'd love to get your questions and uh, we'll do another uh, mailbag segment later in the week. We'd love to answer your question on the air. I want to bring on my guest, uh, Dana Lyons. Uh, Dana's from uh, J Lyons Fund Management in, uh, in the uh, Chicago area. Dana, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Dave. Great to be back. So we were talking before we started. I, uh, I, I looked up to confirm exactly when you were on. You came on the show end of January and, and made what ended up being very prescient comments about put call ratios about a market that had achieved a resistance level. And that ended up being pretty soon, uh, you know, right before the market started to roll over. So I'm really excited to have you back on to see what your toolkit is telling you about the current environment. What can you tell us? Well, first off, my calls are always at perfect day. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Um, so what we're seeing, you know, uh, put the call ratio is just a, a, an example of sentiment. Obviously price is the most important thing, but we have ancillary um, uh, types of indicators, which can help you anticipate what, uh, what is, uh, what, what the greatest odds are of uh, where prices might go. And sentiment is one of those, uh, one of those uh, metrics, one of those tools that we have. And uh, generally it moves in a uh, contrarian fashion. So when people get over, um, you know, all towards the bullish side of the boat, then generally the market is vulnerable and vice versa. When people get too fearful, um, then uh, then typically better things happen in the market. So uh, last time we spoke was at the, uh, I think, end of January, early February, and it would be probably around that second to uh, furthest right blue dot at the top when uh, the last time we saw put the call ratio is this actually not even this low. They were historically low, um, which suggested maybe some vulnerability in the market uh, as people were not, uh, did not have the protection against the decline. And obviously we did see 
um, uh, uh, the market crashed a couple weeks after that. And amazingly, we are after a spike, a historic spike in fear, we're back down to put the call ratios that are about at historic lows again, despite what we just went through with the market crash. So interesting to see uh, how sentiment has gotten so bullish again here. It's amazing, right? And and I and I think from a contrarian perspective, right, it suggests that people would be, you know, caught on the wrong side of any sort of pullback. How do you reconcile that with your second chart, which is which is confirming sort of just this breadth that's continued to be pretty positive, right? Sure. There's, you know, as a market analyst, there's always positives and negatives to uh, balance out against each other. So sometimes the 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 reconciling factor is duration. So from a longer term uh, perspective, the advanced decline line now going back to an all time high is certainly uh, a positive sign. It's one of the more um, I would say consistent uh, tools uh, from a breadth perspective in um, in uh, helping one determine the, the the likely fate of the market. So going back to new highs is a sign that you know uh, from from an overall perspective. Um, uh, the, uh, a broad participation, uh, a broad uh, number of stocks are participating in this rally. So that puts a better foundation under the rally than if we're only being led by, you know, a couple of generals or one or two sectors. You know, what, it's, what, I, what I love about the third chart that you sent, it sort of speaks to that, 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 that challenge, right? I think a lot of people were, you know, at times skeptical of the rally we've been in because of, you know, quote unquote, narrow leadership, right? The mega cap. Mm -hmm led trade, but here you're looking at essentially the median stock in the in the index. What what does the value line geometric composite tell you? Yeah, no, this is really interesting because you're all, even within balancing those positive and negative uh, factors, there might be uh, factors within the same uh, type of metric. So this one is also measuring the type of breath, but not as constructive as the advanced decline line. Value line measures basically the median stock performance in a universe of 1800 stocks and you can see right now it's really our favorite uh, way of measuring the broad market and right now you can see it has not uh moved back into a, a new high like the advanced decline line and in fact it's moving right now we think into a uh, an area an array of uh, pretty significant resistance so uh i, I think this could be a uh, pretty key uh, pre, uh pretty uh, uh uh important time in the market right now whether we get whether we're able to fight through this resistance here in the value line or we could fail and that would keep the scenario the potential scenario for a retest uh in the, in the cards for the broader market and making this uh merely a bear market rally so always uh always the positives to uh balance out against the negatives and this is certainly uh, a chart to keep your eye on so, Danny, we only have about 30 seconds left, but I'd love to just ask you about the, the broad market. So clearly the, the trend has been positive. You know, we have all these stocks that have, you know, just been so impressive with their rallies. If we do, you know, if this does, if this does turn into more of a bear market rally scenario, if it becomes clear and clear, is there a, a level, what signal or what, what, what uh, level would you see on the S&P or what pattern would you see that would tell you, okay, this next top is in and we need to be getting more defensive. Is there a line in the sand that stands out to you or a certain signal that you would be looking for right about now? Not necessarily in the S&P. I would keep an, an eye on that 480-ish level in the value line mm -hmm. and okay. also keep your eye on those lagging sectors that you were talking about uh, earlier, the, the uh, small caps, Europe, um, energy, financials, key things to keep an eye on because they did bust out of that consolidation a couple weeks ago all testing key levels of resistance right now that can make or break uh, whether you know we continue upward maybe in a parabolic fashion or whether this thing fails right now and you know we get another leg down. Dana, this is such a great take. I, I love the charts you sent. I really appreciate your perspective trying to combine all these different inputs. Uh, Dana Lyons from J Lyons Fund Management. Thanks again for coming on the show. My pleasure, Dave. So that was Dana Lyons. Dana's the editor of the Lion's Share Report. Does such a great job of just trying to make sense of all these different inputs. You know, I, I think a lot of the questions I've gotten over time, you know, deal with just how you try to make sense of things, what, you know, what you're looking at. And I, what I like about uh, Dana's point is it's, it's, it's simple, but it's super straightforward and understandable, which is, you know, looking at some of the, the leadership, especially his last comment, thinking about some of these groupers that have uh, that have had a nice rally uh, coming on late and seeing if they're able to eclipse some of those key levels.
All right, we're going to move on to the final bar mailbag. As I've, uh, I've told you many times, one of my favorite parts of the show is being able to answer your questions. And having said that, we're going to start very quickly with a poll we asked of you uh, not too long ago because I just asked Dana sort of where he thought things were headed. I asked all of you, when do you think the S&P 500 will break to new highs uh, over 3,400? And the answers were in the next week, which would be by the end of this week, June 12th, uh, in the next month, so by the 4th of July holiday, by the end of t- the year 2020, or not for a long, four O's long time. <laughs> and 19% of you said not for a long time. The, uh, the, the uh, largest answer, the most common answer was in the next month, 37% of you. 33% of you said by the end of the year 2020, and only 12% said uh, this week. So that tells me 60, almost 70, actually 70% of you um, send, said either in the next month or by the end of the year, we're gonna break the S&P to new highs, which feels about right. I think that's the optimism I would, I would expect right here. Very few of, expect, uh, of you expecting it this week, and, and uh, if today is any indication, I think you might, you might end up being right on that. But thanks for that. I, again, thinking about the probabilities of some of those outcomes can be helpful, not as a you know, decision-making tool, but just a way of jo- nudging, your th- nodding, uh, nudging your thinking and uh, helping you reevaluate some potential outcomes. Let's get to the mailbag uh, questions. Uh, one of your mailbag questions, I answer that institutional buyers trade in the final hour of the trading day. Why is it they trade in the final hour? I mean, uh, investors, individuals tend to trade on patterns, support and resistance levels. What's special about the final hour? It's a, it's a really good question. There's a lot of ways I could answer it, but I, I will summarize it by this. When you're at a larger institution, if you're running tens of billions of dollars or, or more, your goal in a lot of ways is not to overwhelm the market, right? Because if you need to t- accumulate a position in a stock, or uh, sell a bit larger position, you can't just go and sell it because it'll shock the market and the market will see a huge buyer, huge sellers coming in, and all of a sudden it'll completely destroy the market in the short term. It'll make it very difficult for you to do what you need. So larger trades are usually broken up over a larger period of time. And during the day, one of the ways you can minimize the impact on the market is put it right at the end of the day because that's when you can put in big orders and there's no, you know, the time's gonna run out. So it's not like people can, try to jump the gun too much. Uh, so, so that's what a lot of things would happen at the end of the day. And so you usually consider the first 30 minutes as more of a retail oriented uh, environment where, where people would be reacting to overnight u- uh, news. The last hour is more of an institutional hour. There's actually an indicator called the smart money index or something like that, that looks at those two uh, timeframes and tries to draw some conclusions from that. Thanks for that question. Next question, I've been using moving average crossovers, the 50 and 200 day exponential moving averages to find stocks to buy. I find many of these become overbought and I use the same combination uh, to sell and it ends up being too late. Really good question. So the question was, should I use the same indicator, same moving average combination for buy ideas and sell ideas? I would tell you that, listen, you've, you've brought up, I think one of the big um, challenges a lot of uh, novice investors make, or when you're just trying to, to fill things out, when you, you basically treat your buy rules and your sell rules just as the opposite of each other. I come up with a great way of buying, identify when to buy, and then my sell discipline is just the inverted that, right? If the opposite happens, I'll sell. And when you're designing a trading system, if you really go and test things, I think you'll find that just inverting your buy signals is usually not the best way to to sell. And I think it speaks to the fact that stocks move up and they move down in different ways. Stocks tend to, you know, accumulate over time. They take the stairs up or they take the escalator up. They take the elevator down. They shoot down much quicker. And so I think you're right in thinking there could be different combinations. If you're using a crossover system, I would test some shorter term combinations for the sell side um, and, uh, and, and, and think of it that way. The other one is, is use some other sort of trailing stops, some other sort of lagging indicator that might allow you to at least take part of the trade off uh, earlier in the downtrend and, uh, and get you out earlier in the, in the, in the phase. I think that's a great question. I hope that helps you, uh, helps you make sense of it. Next one, also moving average oriented, the S&P chart review indicates the death cross of the 50 day crossing down through the 200 day. Okay, I'll take that um, uh, here. Um, ba, 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 the market has been rampant. By the time the golden cross occurs, we would have, right. So you're basically saying the sell, the quote unquote sell signal where the 50 day crosses down through the day, down, down through the 200 day was here. That's actually after the bottom. And now we're rallying the golden cross could come after. I think the 50 and 200 day as a crossover system is not anything you will ever hear me really refer to because in my own work, I found it's actually not a great system. There have been times, if you look from like, 
the mid 90s to about 2008, it was a fantastic system and it kept you in and out of these, you know, basically just called the cyclical bull and bear markets pretty well because it was a very natural cycle that happened uh, during that sort of 15, 20 year period. Since then though, I think it's become a lot more uh, challenging uh, because you've had this situation where big sell-offs have been, uh, have turned higher, right? So you've had more corrective periods like 2010, 2011, like 2015, 2016, which weren't huge rotations. It was more of a big pullback before the next like higher in this secular bull market. So that, that crossover, crossover system, if you tested in the last 10 years, I would argue probably has not done very, very well. And so I think you're better served looking at some other combinations that might uh, help you track some of these turns uh, uh, a little bit better. So, so I think you're absolutely right. It did indeed, if you talk about the death cross, it's right here after the bottom. The golden cross could happen at or near a market top. I think in the financial media, they love to talk about it because the names are very compelling. If you test them, I found a lot of other things are much more uh, effective than those. That's our mailbag for today, boy. We only got to a couple of them, but I really appreciate those uh, those questions that you you guys sent in. As a reminder, just shoot us an email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. We'd love to answer your question on our next show. We need to wrap the show, folks, and go right to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is looking at the pure growth versus pure value ETF. So we've talked a lot about the growth versus value trade. And uh, and and again, I've over my career starting in 2000 to where we're at now, I've heard people talk about the quote unquote return of value innumerable times. Overall, it's not worked yet because growth has continued to, to work, especially in recent years during this sort of mega cap growth led uh, environment. These two ETFs in particular are called the pure growth and pure value uh, um, ETFs because they basically separate the universe into two groups. So a stock is either classified as growth or as value. And so it it, it, it doesn't double count because a lot in, in other indexes, they actually double count. A stock could be both growth and value, for example. Here it gives you a little, little purer read, perhaps, on, uh, on, on which, is, uh, which is doing where. Um, I think it's interesting to note that this has certainly rolled over to a degree I've not seen in, in quite a while, which is a now breakdown, lower highs, lower lows in this ratio, illustrating that return to value. You know, a lot of that is driven by the rally that we've seen in energy, financials, some of these big beaten down sectors that have just come on strong in the last uh, in the last month or so. I think the question is, uh, as Dana Lyons has mentioned, is are you, do you get the follow through? Does that continue to work? Because it's had a nice run. This is either the, you know, that was it, and then we resume higher, we go back to this growth-led environment, or value continues to work. And this is the chart I would look at to try and track uh, that sort of uh, evolution of, uh, of leadership. Chart number two is looking at factor returns. And I started the clock at the market top in uh, February, just to show how some of the more common factor ETFs have done relative to another. I didn't take the time to label these. I'm really sorry, but I'll point them out. The black sort of bold face line is the S&P 500. So still uh, about three plus percent off of its February market high. The only factor that has led is quality. And again, this is during the entire round trip of that environment. In red, we have momentum. In yellow, we have size. In purple, we have minimum volatility. And in blue, we have value. So if you start the clock at the market top in February, value is actually the worst of those uh, five factors. And again, worse than the S&P uh, as well. The only factor that's outperformed the S&P using these ETFs is the, uh, is the quality factor. It's basically earnings quality, quality earners, quality growers. Um, having said that, if you start the clock at the low, you'll see value does a lot better and you'll see the number one group uh, is actually size. And that's a lot of those, uh, the leadership in both of those has come on strong at the end because small caps have been lagging, all of a sudden really started to, uh, to accelerate. So depending on where you start the clock, you'll get a little different read on, uh, on factor returns. Finally, I just want to point out again, I'm always looking for key charts to pay attention to. I think so many stocks are facing key resistance levels. The chart of Apple certainly indicating you, uh, you know, underlying confidence in the strength of Apple and the strength of the equity, uh, the equity markets. Now I'm watching to see, does it become uh, extremely overbought with an RSI above 80? That would tend to make it more look like mid-November, make it look like early uh, January of, uh, of this year, which was the, uh, you know, not the end of the move. There was further upside uh, past that. So it'd be interesting to see if uh, stocks like Apple, that mega cap tech trade, return to relative leadership. Folks, that's our show for today. I want to thank my guest, Dana Lyons from J Lyons Fund Management, editor of the Lions Share Report, for giving us his perspective today. As a reminder, shoot us your questions, the final bar at stockcharts.com. For stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. 
Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.